Now, a major theme of this symposium is that there are strong parallels between the evolutionary origin of species within populations and new concepts for the origin of species within um, populations like the tissues of the body, which is, of course, then a cancer. And the analogy is very clear from what has been said so far. The analogy is that cancers can be regarded as a new species developing within the host organism. That's the central idea. Now, my presentation will show that to understand this parallel and to use it effectively, we need to turn the current theory of uh, current popular theory of evolution, the modern synthesis, on its head. That theory is based on the idea that inherited variations are purely random. The better survival of fitter organisms is then attributed to blind, that is, undirected natural selection. I will show in my talk that the reverse is the case. Cells and organisms control the stochasticity uh, within that means that they do so in a way that gives directionality. Just before I go to my main slides, if we understand the physiological control processes by which the body achieves this directionality, we will better understand how cancers behave. And that is the main take home message uh, of my talk. So stage one of the argument is that cellular stochasticity not only exists, it's extremely extensive even in cloned tissues with the same genome in all the cells. That's been known for a long time, first as an idea. In fact, it was the great geneticist August Weissmann, himself one of the great um, founders of the modern synthesis, who proposed the idea of selection of cells in the germline. You can't have selection if there aren't differences. And this idea was resurrected recently by Jean-Jacques Coupier, a French biologist, um, in 1983. But the real evidence for this comes from the work of Huang and his colleagues on large variation in expression levels in cells. And this is from their work. What it shows is the variation in expression level in a whole population of cells, a particular uh, cloned population of one particular protein. It happens to be a cell adhesion protein, but you'd find variation of this kind for all expression levels. The important thing to note is the range is 1,000 fold. So a cell here might be next door to a cell here, but it has something like three orders of magnitude greater degree of expression. Now, the next important point to note is this is not a property of the cells themselves, it's a property of the population, because if you study it over a whole week, the, the, the attractor, which is the, the way in which the population as a whole determines the expression levels of the cells or determines their distribution, stays exactly the same. Furthermore, if you clone from high expression levels, they will initially show exactly the same degree of expression as in the parent cells, that is high expression. But over just a few days, the whole population reverts to the distribution. This is the evidence, this is a population attractor. So how can populations of cells determine the expression levels in this kind of way? Well, the answer lies in something that's been very familiar to physiologists and integrative biochemists for many, many years, which is that it's the cell networks that determine the expression levels and the phenotype. And the evidence for that comes from two kinds of line. One is that knockouts and protein blockers are often silent, even if the particular protein forms a very important function in what is going on. What is happening here, of course, is robustness. And the second piece of evidence is from the, the very low association scores in uh, genome-wide association studies. This is a diagram I often use to explain the point. Um, 
DNA is down here, we've got the phenotype up here, and the environment, of course, and all three are interacting with those determining biological networks, the signaling pathways that act as filters and conditioners or incubators that enable and restrict the reactions that can occur. That is not entirely determined by the DNA. So that if you block one particular um, gene or use a blocker of the protein so that it no longer functions, you may see no change in phenotype, even if that gene and its protein was highly functional. In that case, you may need to do uh, two knockouts or even more in order to get through to the phenotype. So I will show an example of that from my own work. It's uh, from heart rhythm. The top here, we have the rhythm being generated electrically and two of the protein mechanisms that generate that rhythm. And what you'll notice is as we knock one of them down with a blocker, or you could think of it as a gene knockout, you find that there's an extremely small variation in the frequency. The functionality stays the same, almost the same. And the reason is that another mechanism kicks in due to this small change in potential that occurs that enables the cardiac rhythm to continue even when major components are knocked out. You find the same when you discuss circadian rhythm, for example. You can knock out a circadian rhythm gene in a mouse and it will still continue to have circadian rhythm. Now, much the same kind of conclusion comes from the genome-wide association studies. This is a very important paper that's appeared just three years ago. The fact is that many genes in the genome-wide association studies show very low association with function. Now, the conclusion that Boyle and his colleagues come to is that this implies, as I think it does too, as a physiologist, that all genes, or nearly all, contribute to many functions. It's, it's better to look at it that way than to be misled by the idea that there's a specific gene for this. There's no specific gene for cardiac rhythm. That's the point that's being made. It means two things that are very important. First of all, linear addition of such data, if you try in genome-wide association studies, does it were get more functionality apparently by adding all the low association scores together. That won't work because linear addition doesn't work in that kind of situation. If the logic is A plus B, then there will be C, you won't have C if either A or B are absent. You can't add the two associations together. That means, I think, that gene-centric views of development and evolution need revising. So that brings me to stage two of the argument that cellular stochasticity is not only very large, even in cloned populations with the same genome each cell, but obviously even larger in uh, populations that have already developed diversity, but it is also harnessed and is functional. I highlighted this point in a meeting held in the United Kingdom at the Royal Society, the National Academy of Science in the UK, held just four years ago on new trends in evolutionary biology. And my conclusion of the paper that was published subsequently in one of the Royal Society journals is that stochasticity is harnessed, used by organisms to generate functionality. Randomness, therefore, at the level of mutations does not therefore necessarily imply lack of function or blind chance at higher levels. In this respect, incidentally, biology must resemble physics in the sense of generating order at a high thermodynamic level, for example, where the thermodynamic laws are very uh, precise, from disorder, the random movement of molecules to low level, and that must be true of biology just as much as it is true um, of physics. There are, of course, exceptions. We know of the outlier genetic diseases where the correlation between a particular gene and the function is extremely strong, but those are the outliers. They're not what guide us to the usual situation. 
I drew attention to this in an article uh, published just two or three years ago in the journal Biology. One of the consequences for evolutionary biology is very profound indeed. It means that evolution does have a direction. Many of you will have read the brilliant book by Richard Dawkins, Was the Watchmaker Blind? And of course, it's expressing the modern synthesis view that evolution is indeed a blind process. We are arguing that these processes of harnessing stochasticity automatically give rise to a directionality in the evolutionary process. So the question coming back now to the implication of these ideas for cancer is, is development of a cancer directed? Now, it seems to me to be fairly obvious that at the early stages, cancer cells, which by definition will be doing something different from the rest of the population, must be under stress. That very fact that they are functioning differently means that they will be under stress in that particular population. Come back to what I said earlier on. It is populations through their control mechanisms that dictate what individual cells should be doing. What do cells do and populations of cells do under stress? We've learned that already in this symposium from James Shapiro and from others. They shuffle their genomes. And the result, of course, is a very rapid radiation of cell forms, which is precisely what people find. Now, the final and third stage of my argument is that tumors therefore develop just as all the other cells in the body develop by harnessing stochasticity. They've got their own directionality. So the hypothesis, and I'm getting quite close to the end of my presentation, I think I'm going to save the organizers a bit of time. My hypothesis is very simple. It is that cells under stress must hypermutate. They all do so, and they will therefore shuffle their DNA. There is no surprise whatsoever in the fact, therefore, that you get very, very many um, changes in the DNA of the cancerous cells. The next point to note, though, is this can be enormous. We know that from, for example, the immune system hypermutation it can increase the frequency of change by anything up to a million fold. And the reason is very simple. We come back to the point I was making earlier on. Part of the control that the system as a whole, the cell in this case, has over its genome is precisely on the error correcting process. The natural error rate for DNA copying is really quite high. You would have several hundred thousand errors if that was all that was happening in the replication of DNA in your cells and mine. By changing um, that through the error correction procedure, you, you end up with hardly any error, even in a three billion length genome. But the point here, of course, is that by turning down that error correction, you can easily get many, many more mutations. And that's precisely what cells are capable of doing. Now, my conclusion from this is, of course, that drug development clearly can't keep up with that. If we get hypermutations of this kind of rate, how could we possibly develop drugs quickly enough to deal with it? Now, I come to the last part of what I want to say on the technical side of this uh, presentation before I then come to uh, my brief conclusions. I think it's also likely to be true that anti-cancer therapy uh, makes all of this worse sometimes rather than better because it will itself be a form of stress. So that itself will stimulate changing uh, of genome. But it will also do something else which will come up in a a presentation later on by uh, Scott Bonner in this symposium. I think it probably stimulates the formation of extracellular vesicles. And what he will show, and it's just an advert for his presentation now coming up later, uh, that can um, proceed 
promote metastasis. I have one final comment to make before I come to my concluding slide, which is a speculation. You see, there is a, an alternative to the somatic mutation theory, which is the tissue organization field theory of cancer, proposed by Anna Soto and Carver Sonshine uh, back in 2011 in a review in bioessays. I speculate that it might be that the communication between cells by the extracellular vesicles might be the basis of the field proposed by the tissue organization field theory. Uh, there is therefore, it seems to me, a possible uh, process physiologically by which we can envisage uh, that theory working. So to conclude then, um, tissue stochasticity exists and is very extensive. The second thing is that, as we've seen, the physiological control mechanisms enable that stochasticity to be harnessed, used, and therefore the process of development is directional. Second or third rather, cells under stress will naturally hypermutate. That hypermutation could be extremely rapid and that would in itself um, explain the ineffectiveness of the treatment of late stage cancers that we heard about at the very beginning from Azra Zaza in her presentation to this symposium. And with that concluding summary, uh, I would say thank you very much for having me on this symposium uh, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dennis. That was uh, really fantastic. And one of the questions that's come up and we have a, a, just a few minutes for questions, but one of the things that's been in the chat and that I've been curious about is how do you view uh, genetic instability as an uh, intrinsic driver of evolutionary mutation and evolution versus the need for external stress on the cells uh, to drive evolution. So you're distinguishing, just to make this clear, Ken, you're distinguishing between the natural tendency of cells under any kind of stress to proceed to shuffle their genomes or hypermutate from what the environment might do. I, I don't fully distinguish between those because I think as I showed in my slide of the physiological processes involved, um, the environment is interacting with those networks just as much as the DNA is and as the phenotype as a whole is. So I'm not quite sure that I fully understood um, the, the question. Well, I don't want to take up all the time, but I'm, for example, a mutation in a DNA damage response gene will automatically uh, give you give the cell a, uh, an ability to uh, change its genome. Or yes, change indeed. Its DNA yes, around. I see that. Yeah. Yes, versus, yes versus, indeed. Versus, yes. You know, external stress uh, leading to those changes, which I think is extremely important. One of the Indeed, questions. Though, I totally agree with that. And I'm just saying that they'll all mesh together, won't they? Because these are different forms of causation, uh, different forms of stress that will lead to the same kind of result. Great. Um, one of the questions in the, the chat is, is what form do you think a solution to cancer might look like since drugs cannot keep up with the active sort of restructuring activities of cells? That's the big question for this symposium, isn't it? And I, I go with what uh, Azra said at the very beginning of the symposium. We have to shift our resources and they're huge. We know the investment in cancer uh, research is enormous. We have to shift our resources to the early stage. We've obviously not really succeeded with, uh, except in rare cases, we know. and. and, and uh, you know, people can survive cancers even in the third and fourth stage. That's not the point. But the statistics show that we are not succeeding much better than we did something like 50 years ago. 
So I think we have to convince the funding bodies that there has to be a shift towards what might uh, improve the situation, which is, of course, the early stage detection. And the previous um, uh, presentation from Anne Barker also highlighted that there are ways in which this can be done. Um, Jin Song Liu um, put a comment in the chat that uh, says tissue field organization theory uh, cannot explain the benign and mal malignant phenotype of tumors. Um, do you have a response to that? Well, I, I wish Carlos Sunshine could be here to respond to that. Um, I don't know. I'm simply speculating um, on a possible role creating a kind of field, but a field that's dependent upon particulate matter for how cells could communicate and therefore there could be a field effect. I'm not, I have to say, an expert on the tissue uh, organization field theory. So I can't answer that. It might be that Carlos Sunshine, if he's online, can send a, 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 a suggestion to the chat line. Great. Um, well, uh, thank you so much for uh, just an amazing and stimulating talk. And I'll turn over this over to uh, Tamara Thorne to introduce our next speaker.